Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Trade Up. I hope you all are doing really well. Wishing you all a very happy Republic Day. Uh, there's a lot of things happening here in the National Capital Region and uh, as news reporters are also mentioning, it's an unprecedented day. So I hope you all are watching the news, staying updated about what is happening. And you did uh, watch uh, the morning event also that was organized for all the citizens uh, to celebrate uh, the, the Republic Day that we're celebrating today. Let's very quickly get started and it's a very relevant day today to look at post-colonial writers because when we are talking about the Republic Day, we are also talking about how we started laying down the foundations of our nation. And whenever we uh, we, we talk about the Republic Day, the significance of the Republic Day, that is where um, after two years, 11 months uh, and 11 days, we finally got our Indian constitution. And this constitution, uh, one of the lengthiest constitution that we are having, uh, borrowing from a couple of constitutions is clearly, clearly uh, wanted to empower each and every citizen and that's the reason we saw that there was no discrimination whatsoever in the constitution and of course they kept on upgrading it with the various amendments that came about. Now here we are dealing with uh, like you know just after colonization ended we framed our constitution and to celebrate that we celebrate the Republic Day uh, the coming of the constitution, India becoming a republic. The same way we have these post-colonial writers and these post-colonial writers are extremely important for all of us not not only are they being asked in examination, but you'll always see when you enter the academic uh, arena, you will definitely in at least six months uh, come across one paper presentation, one conference, uh, one seminar, one uh, like you know webinar or any other thing of that sort which is being organized. It'll actually be around post-colonial writers, right? Uh, the, the recent... Uh, writings also that have been focusing on this post-colonial zeal and how this post-colonial term has become very trending in a way and there is mind-boggling amount of literature that has been produced now uh, and that is a reason it becomes a little a little more chaotic for us to study post-colonial writers but net has predominantly been very kind to give us some important writers always and of course some writers who are famous they keep on asking us about those writers right now today through the course of this lecture we will talk about the development of post-colonial term, how uh, we had this disappearance of the Commonwealth literature, what was post-colonial literature, how was it different from Commonwealth literature, where did Commonwealth literature suddenly go away, uh, even though we were receiving Commonwealth Writers Prize, and how did it disappear one fine day, what were the reasons behind the disappearance, how essentially uh, we have this entire idea of post-colonialism. Uh, so we will discuss all these, but our primary focus through the the course of today's lecture will be on post-colonial writers, post-colonial uh, important uh, sources and literary studies that are coming about. Uh, so let's just very, very quickly dive into the study. We will look at five previous year's questions as we always customarily look at. And today I have added almost very, very simple questions. I think barring one question that I have added for Canadian poetry, um, the rest of them are pretty simple. And I think all of you should get full marks out of it. So it's just to encourage you to boost you that if you're studying, you will definitely be able to uh, mark a lot of questions correctly. Then, of course, we'll get into the main topic, the most important post-colonial writers that we are having. And here we will look at very fundamental writers. And still these writers you'll be able to find in your basic exams, even in your net exams. Um, we will look at your doubts and we will also towards the end, uh, like, you know, answer this question that how can we remember stuff easily? What is this, uh, like, you know, how can we ensure that whatever we read how can we remember uh, even though it's something that you all know but we will touch upon this we'll touch upon certain studies also that have proven and this will just be like a five to ten minute activity that we'll do on how you can remember stuff easily okay so let's very quickly get started with your quiz this is the first question for today Samuel Butler's Hugh D. Brass is modeled upon so Samuel Butler's Hugh D. Brass which was a satire on Puritans it's considered to be one of the most famous satires that we are having on the Puritans, that is Hugh de Brass, was actually modeled on which of the following works? This is Annus Mirabilis by John Dryden, Endymion by Keats, as well as Benjamin Disraeli, Don Quixote by Cervantes, or Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Which is the correct answer very, very quickly. All right, so I can see most of you have joined. Um, just a second. I hope my voice is also audible. I'll, I'll just sit today. Uh, I'll just mute myself. Give me one second. It's not able to do this. 
Mm, perfect. Now I've muted myself, so you'll not be able to get a double voice at all. All right. Uh, so we've got a lot of you who have joined over here. We've got Priyanka. We've got Shadab. We've got uh, Tiasa who has joined us. Uh, there's Rachna. Rachna, you've joined uh, from via YouTube today. There is Liji. Uh, there is Barsha. There is Poonam. Uh, there is Nitya. Nityanand is also there. Liji is also there. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, guys, uh, th this is a very important thing that Lydia has highlighted. Uh, your NEC exams for tentative dates have been announced. Uh, even on uh, the Greta platform, you can actually see the videos that have been prepared for you throughout the day today to let you know that the tentative dates are out. You've got like, you know, around two to three months. So you can say 60 to 75 proper days uh, for your studies. So definitely we will be preparing an action plan accordingly for all of you. Okay. Uh, Rachna, you're not able to listen to the audio. Can all of you see? Okay, I think most of you can see it, right? All right, no worries. So here we've got uh, Madhu, we've got Sneha, we've got Sunita, we've got Pooja, Anand. Uh, there's Rachna, Rajesh is also there, Rabia, Madhu, Sukiti. Good evening. Sukiti was the first one to join. All right. So absolutely right. All of you have given the correct answer. Don Quixote by Cervantes. Now let me tell you, uh, these are the most important works, okay? These works have to be on your fingertips. Thomas More's Utopia, uh, when you talk about Don Quixote, Cervantes' uh, Cervantes's Don Quixote, Hugh de Brass, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. These are very important works that have to be on your fingertips. You get questions on the parts. You get questions on the turning points. You get questions that are asked on the major characters. You also are asked questions about uh, what are the major incidents that are taking place in the work. So these are very important works. These are must-read works for all of you from the examination point of view. Always remember that. So this is very crucial for you. And Don Quixote is the the right answer. So Hudibras by Butler. So Samuel Butler's Hudibras was actually considered to be one of the best uh, satires on Puritans. And you know, uh, Hudibras was also trying to criticize everyone who had mindlessly gone against the monarchy. Uh, so what Butler was trying to say, it was a very important point. Samuel Butler was trying to say it's fine that some people genuinely believed that monarchy was bad and therefore they were going against it. But mindlessly people just following the Puritans like the Presbyterians wasn't uh, an absolutely correct answer to the problems that uh, England was facing at that particular time. And Butler was absolutely right. Without a proper substitute, if you're going to just completely relinquish uh, monarchy, if you're going to uh, annihilate monarchy, if you're going to destroy monarchy without a proper substitute, it will not be helpful. It will not at all be helpful. So Butler was posing a very important and a serious question. Hugh de Brass was actually against religious sect Sectarianism. Religious sectarianism is also getting targeted by Jonathan Swift. So Jonathan Swift in A Tale of Tub is telling us about the fact that, you know, whenever you're talking about religion, religion has been divisive. Religion has, uh, especially at that time when we are talking about so Catholics uh, divided into Protestantism, Anglicanism, Anglicanism further divided into your Quakers, your Puritans, your Presbyterians. Uh, so there were fissures. There were these gaps that had come in between religion and ultimate purpose of religion was to unite people and here religion was not uniting here religion was dividing people here religion rather than uniting people was actually dividing people which was really a cause of concern for people like Butler so here Hudibras is really criticizing it is trying to criticize it was extremely popular see basically uh, there were certain things which were very very popular like you know some some jokes we have about a particular community they, they become very popular similarly Hudibras was very popular because in that time if if you look at from the perspective of the new historics right uh, new historicism you will see that there was actually uh, this entire notion that you know if you go you were going against Puritans you were making fun of Puritans it was acceptable it was really acceptable and especially after restoration it was considered to be the norm it became the rule that you have to make fun of Puritans. You have to make fun of the narrow mindedness of the Puritans. You have to do that. Right. You have to do that. So that is certainly something which you have to uh, like, you know, remember and keep in mind. And QT Brass is actually based on Don Quixote. Of course, it is having many references to contemporary events and personalities. But predominantly, the source that is there is Cervantes Don Quixote. And remember, whenever we are talking about, for example, uh, postmodern novels, we say that, you know, Don Quixote by Cervantes, Tristram Shandy, these are all important 
important works which are actually forming the backbone of postmodernism by giving us those very uh, like you know examples that not following the conventional way of writing trying to uh, like you know follow a different way of writing trying to deconstruct that was very important in these novels and therefore they were postmodern in that way all right so this is something which is important crucial a uh, hudi prass is a mock narrative poem it is a mock narrative poem of the restoration age and in the restoration age as it is if you were against the puritans you were getting you were getting the support of the monarchy you were getting the support of the people in power and it's not just criticizing the puritans but also the other religious sects who were going against who were going against monarchy during the civil war people who had gone against monarchy Okay, during the civil war, they were castigated. They were criticized over here in the work. The epic is telling us about Sir Hugh de Bras, and Sir Hugh de Bras is an arrogant Presbyterian knight. He is, of course, having a lot of knowledge, but he is very stupid. For example, if you have a lot of knowledge, but you know, if there is a different context going on, and you say something foolish in that context, or you know, there is a different context going on, and you use your knowledge which is not appropriate to the context, then you you look stupid. For example, if people are asking you some question and you answer a completely different question, they'll be like, "Arey bhai, answer to kar do. Question kya puch raha hai?" Right? That is the thing that we we usually have. So Hudi Bras, even though he is knowledgeable, but he is not. You know, sometimes when you you you're very well read, you tend to become an armchair critic. What do you become? You become an armchair critic. That means you're just sitting over there and just trying to comment, and that too, you know, your commentary because it's isolated from the reality. It's not proper. for commentary and start proper commentary at all so this was of course a very important one and hudi bras is about right it is about protest people who had protested against monarchy people who had gone against monarchy without even thinking that what is the correct alternative can you see that these writers were so uh, you know they were prescient prescient means that they were visionaries in a way that they could actually comment on the the societies in which they were living they could say that okay fine we agree that monarchy was having problem we know that the court was corrupt but you did not have a better option in the form of the puritans how could you be so mindless so senseless to change a government system so these people you know what the post colonial writers are telling you about art needs to be purposive these people are making art purposive for all of us these people are making art purposive for all of us so that is of course important okay uh yeah ananya ananya saying feminism of course we'll incorporate maybe we can have one mega a uh, marathon session on feminism itself because feminism let me tell you is a, is of course uh, like you know everyone needs to know about it but jokes apart this is very very important because net has always given you a question so if if net is happening twice in a year on a stable year 2020 was of course an anomaly that we had but if you're talking about a normal year when it's conducted twice one of the papers definitely has a question on feminism so i will definitely Ananya, thanks for the suggestion. Rather, see that's the reason I tell all of you to please even join uh, at the studio. Uh, so because if you if you join at the studio, what happens is that you can also just like yesterday I showed you Madhuri Rana's doubt. You can use the Grade Up Studio doubt platform and you can address this doubt. So this kind of a request then is going then on my notepad and then of course there will be a session organized. Not that here I neglect your doubt, but still. Okay, uh, Nargis is asking. Can you please let us know when the net exam is going to be conducted? Nargis, the tentative dates have come up for your net exam, and uh, today, uh, like you know, when we are talking about you, you must have seen the Grade Up channel. Uh, we uh, have had a lot of our faculties who have actually conducted the session also for all of you. To just enlighten you about the dates that have been out, right? so the dates that have actually come out tentatively uh, they've been scheduled so i will just read it from the group itself so um, here of course due to the pandemic we had the june one that got shifted uh, to november right so so that got that got delayed and was deferred uh, to november uh, and that is the reason we can see that the december cycle has been postponed as now being conducted march april 2021 that is what like you know what are the the things that we've got as of now so um it's it's going to be march april 2021 
Uh, so that's the tentative. That's the December 2020 that got deferred. So uh, that is the date so far. So you the, the announcements and now uh, you know if you you would have seen the pattern of major exams. Whenever they're making an announcements, within few uh, days you're getting a proper notification, and then you have to fill the form. And I would suggest the minute the notification comes, you'll of course be told at the channel itself. Please make sure that you fill in the form within the first week itself, because towards the end, then it, the website is cluttered. There's a lot of traffic on the website. And sometimes I've seen students misfilling the form also. So please don't do that at all. And uh, just stay tuned, as it said, so that, you know, you immediately get to know. And we'll, of course, tell you. And rather, I would say now, from today onwards, any vacancy that comes, be it, uh, like, of course, now the, U the UP, um, the UP PCS GIC forms are over. 18th Jan was the last date. Uh, even your gate exam was over. The last date was in December. But now, whatever forms come, even if you're not keen, no, give those exams. Because, you know, if you start giving giving these exams it will boost your confidence I've learned things and you will also become more structured at least one time syllabus this exam se pehle finish karna hai. so that will be the approach so do do that okay uh, I, I think no 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 so Aditya is asking what about June 2021 then uh, they'll, they'll conduct it around uh, like you know a similar date maybe they'll push it back by two to three months then all right so that is of course there <laughs> Okay, right. So I will I will look at all your doubts also. Don't worry about it. Rabia is asking from the classroom platform that who were the Presbyterians? The Presbyterians were a religious group. Okay. See, uh, this is this this is best understood. I always recommend people if you read Jonathan Swift that uh, Swift's A Tale of a Tub, you will actually come to know about these entire categories. Okay. So Presbyterians were a group of religious people, and uh, just like you know, you had Quakers, you had Presbyterians, you had Methodism. So what had happened was that Catholicism, uh, like, you know, saw the emergence of Protestantism and people were not happy with Protestantism also. So there were various sects that actually came out from Protestantism also, such as Methodism, such as Quakerism, such as Presbyterianism, such as Purit Puritanism. So these are all Rapia religious groups that are coming in, right? These are all religious groups that are coming in and uh, these religious groups are showing you the, the gaps which are there. The fissures which are there, the gaps which are there uh, that we are having. Okay, so that is it. So Kriti is asking, does this mean that net will be conducted three times? Uh, see, we definitely need to be prepared, and we hope that it's going to be conducted three times. But I doubt because I don't really think that we have that much of bandwidth in the uh, country at the stage, and there's so many exams that need to be conducted. But yes, definitely for this year, be prepared for two attempts. But I would suggest try and focus on clearing the first attempt itself. Okay, that should be your focus. All right. Uh, hi. Oh, okay. Hi, Kailash. All right. So let's very, very quickly, uh, like, you know, continue over here. So here we can see that this is actually protesting that how can we, how can we go against monarchy when we don't have any other substitute? The title. Now, this is another question that is asked in your exam. Please put it on your blank sheet of paper because this is a question that is asked in your exam. The title, Hugh de Brass has been taken. This title has been taken from Spencer's Perry Queen. The title has been taken from Spencer's Fairy Queen and Hugh de Bras was actually the name of the knight, right? It was the name of the knight that was there. And Spencer had got this term from the King of Britain's Rod Hood. Rod Hood. Rod Hood became Hugh de Bras. Rod Hood, Hugh de Bras. So basically, Hugh de Bras is coming from Spencer's Fairy Queen, and Spencer is getting it from the King of Britain's Rod Hood, Hugh de Bras. So that is the origin of the name. So if they ask you that what is the original source, the original source is King of the Britons, Hod, Red Hod, uh, Hugh de Bras. And if they ask you what was the immediate source of the title, then of course it is Spencer's The Fairy Queen. The poem is written in octosyllabic couplet. This is also important. Hugh de Bras is using iambic tetrameter with closed couplets. Closed couplets. What are closed couplets? See, uh, when we are talking about Kabir Das, so Kabir Das Dohe, those two lines are actually closing the message those are called closed couplets and couplets where the message is not closed in two lines but is continuing those are open cut, uh, couplets that you're having closed couplets is basically where you are having the entire the entire uh, like you know thought process has been said in those two lines itself those two lines are uh, like you know in, in itself and entire theme that the writer the poet is trying to convey 
So do keep that in mind. Hudibras is a work that is satirizing the Puritans. Hudibras is a work that is uh, getting inspired by Don Quixote as well as the important events that are taking place. Hudibras, the title has been taken from Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, written in octosyllabic couplet and iambic tetrameter with closed couplets. So these are important things that we have to keep in mind. And Don Quixote is also a very important work. And you know, you can always make uh, comparisons between Don Quixote and Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. These are some works that are criticizing that, you know, what happens is that uh, we, we read something and we become fascinated. And today, this is what we'll study. Why I have included this purposely is because, you know, today we will look at V.S. Naipaul. And V.S. Naipaul will tell you that post-colonial literature is a literature of failure. Post-colonial literature is a literature of failure. And, and he says that, you know, my father always taught me that ending is when everything is happy. Ending is you've reached an ending where everything is happy. But in reality, that is never the case. In reality, you don't have happy endings. And that is what these post-colonial writers are trying to explore. And Don Quixote, uh, Cervantes' Don Quixote does the same thing. How people are getting influenced by what they are reading. How people start thinking whatever they are reading is actually something that will happen. We start, we start living in a romantic world. What is this called everyone? If anyone who gives me the correct answer, what is this state called? When I read something and I dream about the same thing and I think that, you know, that this is the reality. So, for example, if I read a good book and I, I start dreaming that, yes, this is the reality and I, I go inside thinking about, I get away from reality and I'm thinking about daydreaming. What is this term? We've discussed this term this week itself. Who uh, Whosoever tells me the correct term will uh, get a special coffee whenever they're there in Delhi from my side. Okay. Whoever gives me the right answer will get a special coffee. No, it's not Anki, it's not utopian. So you understood the question. The question is, okay, no, Vandana, it's not imagination. The question, I'll repeat this question again and whoever answers this question correctly, whenever you people are here in Delhi, just let me know and I will, you'll get a free coffee from my side. Okay, a free Starbucks coffee, we'll have it together. No, it's not dream visions, ABC, Shan, it's not reverie. No, not at all. I'm repeating the question again. When I read a book, I start daydreaming. I'm using the term also. I start daydreaming that this is the thing. And we've done this key term this week. Guys, you need to focus on classes. No, 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 no. Excellent. Swati Jha is getting the coffee from my side. Swati Jha from the YouTube platform has answered it absolutely correctly. That is Bovarism. Remember we spoke about Bovarism. Ima, you answered it a little late. Swati had answered it correctly. So Swati is getting the, the, the coffee. Swati, whenever you are here in Delhi, just let me know. All right. Just keep me posted and we'll, we'll definitely catch up at Starbucks and we'll have our coffee together. Or co your coffee would be on my side. Okay. Or maybe we can go to Nick Baker's. They've got this really good coffee cold coffee. So Swati Jha has won the coffee for today and the correct answer is Bovarism. Remember we have studied the term Bovarism. Bovarism coming from Emma Bovari. We've done this term this week itself. We spoke about Bovarism and we talk, We spoke about how Bovarism is when Emma Bovari she reads these romantic tales and she gets transported into the world. And that daydreaming is actually called bovarism, right? So Swati, we, we both are definitely catching up. Okay, I, I might just give one or two more questions like these. So the idea is please revise your lectures because you can get the same questions and you should be having those things on your fingertips, okay? So do keep that in mind, okay? Yes, Priya, the next exam is going to be... Um, <clears throat> Okay, Mrinal is saying that. Okay, yes, definitely Mrinal. Okay, so yes. So here, uh, uh, so, so do remember all these things. So the same Bovarism is actually coming here, right? Bovarism is seen in Don Quixote as well. And uh, Cervantes is trying to criticize that. So all these are very important texts. Let's quickly come on to the next question. Who was the last of the Christian humanists? Who was the last of the Christian humanists that we are talking about? Okay, so who is considered to be, he's very famously called as, no worries, good breath. I, I will ask. Maybe I'll ask one or two more questions like these. I'm always up for coffee. So you don't have to worry. But Ima also answered. Okay, Ima, don't worry. Um, Ima, you can also avail the coffee. Okay, so Swati, you and me together, we'll go together or whenever you're here. Because Ima on the uh, on the classroom platform answered it correctly first. Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> no morium you will get a lot of opportunities don't worry i'm always up for coffee so uh, and i'm always uh, like you know most of the times i'm funding it for my brother so instead of my brother i think i've i've taken all of you so don't worry okay uh okay excellent excellent some of you have given the correct answer let's just see over here how many of you have answered it correctly so so here whenever you talk about the last christian humanist see i'll tell you what what is humanism please understand this humanism is a concept that is saying that of course you know that man is at the center but humanism is also a concept that is showing that you're respecting other men you're respecting other men for example when we talk about a renaissance humanist or the perfect renaissance man that is where we say that philip sidney is a perfect renaissance man why is philip sidney a perfect renaissance sans man because he's foregoing his thirst and he's giving water to his enemy philip sidney gave water to his enemy at the battle of zutphen by saying your need is more than mine your need is more than mine and that is when he offered water that is when he offered water now what you have to understand you have to understand you need to understand this very very simple thing and what is that simple thing that a renaissance humanist or a christian humanist is someone who is foregoing himself for upkeeping the christian virtues john bunyan was someone because of the conventicle act what was the conventicle act the conventicle act had forbidden people from religious gatherings and you had to be a licensed priest only when you had the license could you actually go ahead and preach people but bunyan did not focus on any of those things bunyan was criticized he was he was also imprisoned why why was he imprisoned he was not imprisoned on any charges he was imprisoned on charges that he was preaching other people without a license he was giving sermons to other people without a license so he was literally for him preaching other people spreading the christian word was more important he was more concerned about spreading the christian word than anything else and therefore if you think logically you will come to know and amongst all these people actually see crashaw cannot be crashaw is like you know more of your 17th century poet not really keen on uh, christian humanism at all bunyan is absolutely the correct answer now most of you must have got confused between milton but remember milton was a puritan he was a pure puritan but he was very political he supported the puritan regime he wrote pamphlets for the puritan regime he wrote pamphlets supporting the execution of charles the second he wrote political pamphlets on uh, the freedom of press ergo practica he wrote pamphlets on divorce so he was a man of the world not that john, john bunyan was not a man of the world he was a man of the world but he was religious in nature he considered religion to be more important and oliver cromwell so these two people are more like you know they are man of the world they are men of the world you can say and by men of the world i mean they are wanting worldly pleasures they are wanting fame for example milton wanted to be the great christian poet and great christian poet that means you have that sense that you want to be famous right bunyan did not bunyan did not have any such ideas he just wanted to spread his ideas of christianity alone he just wanted to make people more aware about his ideas so john bunyan therefore becomes the correct answer here he is the last christian humanist okay so do keep that in mind and bunyan is please remember also writing a precursor to modern novel in life and death of mr batman which is a precursor to psychological novels life and death of mr badman life and death of mr badman by john bunyan becomes an example of your modern psychological novels it's a precursor to modern psychological novels right so do uh, do take that in mind yes gurpreet yes you can say that so most of you answered it correctly but do remember bunyan was imprisoned because he wanted to teach other sidney is the perfect renaissance man because he gave water instead of giving it to himself to another person who was dying that is the quality of humanism i do not get myself i give others more value i do not get myself at the center i'm selfless that is what humanism is all about okay uh, and of course this wonderful story bunyan's pilgrim's progress is a must read work why it is must read because you get a question this is considered to be one of the greatest allegory of ideas remember yesterday's class the last lecture we spoke about uh, that allegories were very common during your early english period and you have political allegories which are exemplum 
which are fables which are uh, like you know your tales which are dealing with morality allegories remember the three types of allegories that yesterday we discussed i hope you've all gone through the pdf but this we also spoke in the class right we spoke about the fact that during the lecture that how in the old english period you had exemplum you had allegories you had fables which were very common and here allegory of ideas the idea of good and bad that is being presented over here in this work bunyan's pilgrim's progress what is this telling us this is telling us the same things if you guys have like you know read yesterday's lecture pro properly what saint augustine was telling us remember Saint Augustine, who's writing about confessions, Saint Augustine also is telling us about city of God. That there is city of man, and ultimately the purpose of mankind is to travel from city of uh, man to city of God. The ultimate journey that we have to undertake is the journey that we have to take from city of man to city of God. That is what Saint Augustine talks about. This is what Saint Augustine is discussing. so this is something that we have to keep in mind this whole book begins with author's dream and here you can see the man christian he starts his journey he starts his journey and when he's starting his journey he wants to take his neighbors he wants to take his wife but none of them are willing to go with him and therefore he starts his journey with his own burden right with his own burden i'm telling you that you know christian traveling alone tells you that we ourselves are the sufferers or we ourselves are people who enjoy the benefits of uh, like you know things that were given the heavenly uh, like you know the heavenly blissful life that we're given we are all responsible for that it's all our journey it's an individual journey and how here christian leaves the city of destruction he leaves the city of destruction and travels he is going away so from city of destruction christian is going towards undertaking a journey to the celestial city can you make comparison between what we studied about saint augustine in the previous lecture this is the same thing that we spoke about okay so that is of course there uh, priyanka roy is asking what is realism realism is a form of writing that developed very prominently during the 19th century and that is why we have henry james priyanka that is why we have henry james called the victorian novels as loose baggy monsters so henry james called them as loose baggy monsters why because these victorian novels would describe each and every detail they would tell you each and every aspect about the window about the table about everything that was there it was realistically depicted realism was trying to capture the scene as it is so that you could create that imagination in your mind it was trying to photographically capture information it wanted to capture each and every aspect as people could see it in front of them that was realism right that was realism that you have to remember okay uh, love you sindhiki these are uh, like you know your post colonial writers who are very very famous post colonial writers that you're having this one is of course uh, i am i'm sure by now you've been aware about my fascination for my professor this is of course uh, my love uh, that i have over there uh, professor butalia she's also a post colonial writer and then you are having all your other post colonial writers so this is a very famous picture of uh, we will we'll discuss about this picture also towards the end of this class so don't worry about it okay all right so here you have from city of destruction these are all women post colonial writers okay these are all women post colonial writers these are uh, nine very prominent leaders who have actually helped change the way that post colonialism is perceived through the perspective of women writers also okay so city of destruction the celestial city the first part that you were having you know i purposely put this particular uh, image over here so that you can all remember the the way that your flow charts to be made right this is how you can actually make your flow charts because it's easier for you to remember it's easier for you to uh, capture the information in your mind and remember this is what we discussed tabular formation flow charts then it makes it is even more simpler for all of you to retain things okay so do keep that in mind so oh, sorry just excuse me so sorry 
this is the only thing about winters and here okay so here you can see that you know the first part of this religious allegory was there in 1678 the second one in 84 so 78 and 84 these are the things dates that you have to remember you also must keep in mind this is what i told you that when bunyan was writing there was the conventicle act what was the conventicle act the conventicle act was ensuring that uh, Zishan, uh, as soon as we wrap up, uh, but of course a little more than one hour, okay, a little more than one hour definitely. So you can probably grab a cup of coffee or order some coffee and sit or maybe ask your, uh, like, you know, your brother or sister to make coffee for you right and and just sit over there okay so here the convent uh, the conventicle act the conventicle act was trying to prohibit right was trying to prohibit anyone who was trying to preach without a license imagine even if i have to share my experience i want to get a license for that that was how harsh uh things had actually become and this was like you know under this entire regime only we saw that bunyan was getting bunyan was getting imprisoned and uh there in uh during imprisonment he's of course penning down this entire work i'll hide myself one second so that you can see this this is the conventicle act because of which we saw that you know bunyan was uh, was uh, there like you know he was imprisoned because he was trying to preach other people without a license because of the fact that he wanted to preach other people without a license okay and this book this book is of course a dream but it is telling you the adventures of christian it is telling you how christian leaves and christian is symbolic of every man christian is symbolic of every man like the morality play every man who has to undergo his journey from the city of destruction all the way to the celestial city from the city of destruction to the celestial city okay so do keep that in mind and this is something that you have to remember uh, always and whenever you talk about this uh, this particular person therefore is symbolic of an ordinary individual every man and here we can see that Christian is visited by evangelist. Christian is visited by evangelist who tells him that he will have to carry his own burden. He will have to carry his burden. Can you just see that burden is actually an allegory of <clears throat> the burden that we carry in the society. And the city of destruction is definitely putting a lot of heavy burden on his back. The city of destruction is putting very, uh, like, you know, it's putting enormous amount of, uh, of weight on his, behind his back. So we can clearly see that. That is, of course, there. Uh, and we, we see that Christian tries to tell everyone that I've been guided by the evangelist. Can you guys make comparisons between, uh, like, you know, not yesterday, but in uh, the, uh, the lecture before that, when we were doing world literature uh, of Goiter or when we were doing world literature, remember we, we studied about Hermann Hess. And we spoke about Hermann Hess trying to tell you that there are many Siddharthas. Even Christian is a kind of a Siddhartha. Right. Even Christian is a kind of a Siddhartha. The only fact is that this Siddhartha would not go on wanderings, but this Siddhartha would actually go uh, to like, you know, these various places like the Vanity Fair, uh, like we have uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. We, we see the same action being taking place in in uh, Inferno, Paradiso, Purgatari, uh, Purgatario. But, you know, he's also kind of a Siddhartha who leaves, who leaves this this current world where everything looks very comfortable. He's having a proper heart house is having uh, all the things that are desired by others so you can actually make comparisons that Hermann Hess the German Nobel laureate is also when he's writing about Siddhartha trying to convey very similar ideas as Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress right and he he's leaving alone and that is a sad reality right that is a sad reality that we even keep on hearing in media that we all have to travel alone and here, of course, uh, how the neighbors are not convinced. You've got question: Who are the neighbors? There's obstinate. There's pliable. So, uh, in your in your library, the grade up library that we're creating, and that will be live this week onwards. We will actually be also discussing works like these, right? We will be having works like these, for example, like you know, uh, Pilgrim's Progress discussed in greater details because you get questions on these. You get questions like, for example, for Pilgrim's Progress, you've got detailed questions about his journey. So they are very very important okay this is a question that everyone should get it right it's connected to a question that i gave you yesterday who wrote a tiger does not proclaim its tigritude a tiger does not proclaim its tigritude who was the person who said that everyone should get it correctly so everyone please let us know uh,
love your zindagi just just follow proper methodology uh, don't worry i think a gk and uh, like you know the the language part is going to be an ongoing uh, continuous process so if you're reading newspapers you'll be sorted for that take a look at rajasthan's news what is happening at the rajasthan scenario uh, know about rajasthan's gk there are very uh, many past books which are available but the only problem with rpsc general G, general knowledge is that you have wonderful books um uh, for like you know for rajasthan gk but they're all in hindi so uh, maybe you could take one such book and and try to read that as much as possible try to give some mock test papers also to see and i don't think that will be uh, a lot of an issue for all of you uh, if you're talking about rpsc gk that will not be a challenge so you don't worry too much just plan methodologically and you will be sorted okay focus on some areas there are just some differences in rpsc and and your net otherwise by and large it's pretty much the same and don't forget to focus on paper 1 net that is very important for english students at least okay i'm sure it must be important for other students but for english it will actually help you either get a score or not get a score okay excellent very good all of you let's just see at the uh, at the classroom platform how many of you have answered it correctly um mathri has answered it uh, rabia has answered it ima has answered it correctly wonderful um excellent okay rabia has also written that he he recreates the yorba ebook community yes the yorba ebook community very good very good uh, so ima has answered it sangeeta has answered it correctly we've got shriram rahul uh, rabia sunita bachche no it's not d anand has answered it vandana nargis morjiam aditya sushmita sukriti has answered it rightly shalini bilawat very good very good bilawat you were missing uh, kuhu sushmita excellent okay now please understand what had happened uh, people had started this movement called negritude now negritude was was a movement and in one of the conferences people asked bol soinka that bol soinka what are your opinion soinka what are your opinions on uh, like you know negritude to the reaction to this question he said that you know tigers don't assert their tiger gratitude they just pounce a tiger will never tell you that you know hey i've come buddy i'm going to kill you a tiger just pounces he says that there is no need for you to make movements there is no so during what had happened just understand this when bol soinka was attending a conference he was asked during a conference and this is when he was not a nobel laureate okay this is when he had actually not become uh, like you know this is uh, after this conference 20 years after in 86 he get the nobel prize uh, so this is like you know 20 years before his receiving the nobel prize in a conference he was asked that what are your views about negritude do you think that you are also connected with negritude and he said no i don't need negritude a tiger should not assert a tiger need not even assert his tigritude there is no need for a tiger to assert his tigritude at all that is what wolf soinka says this is actually a response uh, is there uh, oh, oh is there an internet issue over here Okay, it's it's like you know surprisingly coming fine on the YouTube platform, but I saw that the video was going right a little. Okay, so do keep that in mind that you know here Wol Soinka is trying to reply and he's saying that you know there is no need for movements like negritude. Either write about things or just forget it, right? Either write about things, either uh, like you know make sure that you are you are trying to write and assert your tigritude, or else don't create these movements. All right, don't create these movements. So a tig Tiger does not proclaim its tigritude before it strikes. Before I'm striking, if I'm a tiger, I'm not asserting my tigritude at all. And this is what he's saying. This is what he's saying. So here you can see that you know Soinka was absolutely in disagreement with negritude. He said he made this very very famous uh, statement at a conference in Berlin. At a conference in Berlin, and he said that you know I do not I do not need movements like negritude. i will pounce on you i will pounce through my literature on you right i do not need these statements whatsoever and what is negritude negritude was a very important movement which was actually starting properly in france and this movement was trying to ensure that you know there was an encouragement of black consciousness so negritude was trying to it was developed by francophone francophone intellectuals right and politicians of the african diaspora it was related to african diaspora during the 1930s and it wanted to raise awareness about black consciousness it wanted to raise awareness and undo the representation of the blacks 
so it was a francophone right what was it it was basically a francophone it was a francophone intellectual movement uh, a movement of the diasporic writers in the 1930s who want to assert black consciousness Negritude was a cultural movement. It wanted to assert itself, right? There are many, many people who have actually spoken about it. Black graduate students, right, who were coming from the colonies, the colonies of France and Africa. They were showing solidarity, and they said that we need to encourage black consciousness. They said that we need to encourage black consciousness because we are not treated properly. We need to have a proper image of our own selves. and it was a movement that was influenced by movements like the harlem renaissance even harlem renaissance was celebrating blackness uh, movements like the black arts movement were also trying to do that the black arts movement was also a movement to talk about black consciousness the black mountain school of poets the black mountain school of poets were also trying to achieve the same things so negritude uh, harlem renaissance black arts movement black mountain school of poetry these are all works uh, these are all movements which are trying to talk about celebration of blackness but people like soinka saying no we don't need a movement we will just write a piece of work a tiger never proclaims his tigritude he just pounces he just pounces on it right and what are people who are associated very very important and these are this these are our post colonial writers as well these are our afro american or african origin prose writer uh, important post colonial writers as well we have i am cesare the famous writer of tempest right reworking of shakespeare's tempest leopold leopold senghor leopold senghor leon damas leon damas very very important they're starting on with the journal ediquen nor ediquen nor and they're talking about the treatment of blacks in friend in france what is the treatment of blacks what is the uh, what are the problems that the blacks are facing in in france negritude later came to constitute what what was remaining specifically in african politics as like you know so negritude had actually compiled uh, it had got a lot of uh, like you know support from the politicians as well the african politicians who were worried about the diasporic writers but this is very important i am cesare senghor as well as leon damas leon damas these are all important people that you must keep in mind these are all very important people that you have to remember and keep in mind all right so do remember that that is of course there we have the, the jindi warabic movement this is the next question that you are having please very very quickly answer the question the jindi warabic movement yes minal absolutely yes so harlem see basically what had happened minal was that harlem was this place where a lot of criminals were coming so you know people had started perceiving that the black local localities were the places where you always have criminals so that is a, the reason why you had the harlem renaissance to undo undo this particular process okay very quickly please answer this is also something that we have discussed previously very good very good uh, sneha sushmita nargis no bachche uh, aditya garrison mentality is for canadian writers okay uh, nargis uh, no aditya no kuhu is right shushmita no bache uh, kuhu is right uh, anki is right okay have to go up for your comments right now uh -huh. okay lot of you have answered here Yeah, Vandana. Vandana, we are just coming on to the writers and their works, which are very, very important. So we will look at some ten to fifteen writers today via this particular session. Okay, we are just coming on to that. We are just looking at the first part of your question answer. So we are just completing this, and then we are coming on to the writers. Don't worry. So Jindi Warwick movement is a movement that was supporting the Aboriginal population in Australia. So the Aboriginal population that was there in Australia that was getting support from the Jindi Warwick movement in Canadian literature. You have the garrison mentality in canadian literature you have the garrison mentality a uh, garrison just like you know the soldiers have these garrisons that they are creating to protect themselves so that is of course there so here you can remember that okay let's very quickly come on to the next question this is an important question uh, do keep that in mind and this is associated with your important uh, poetic uh, i i wouldn't i'll just tell you the answer but tell me what what do you think is the right answer Priyanka, what is the question that you had? Okay. 
Okay, Priyanka is asking what is surrealism. Priyanka, surrealism is again a, a modern, a, a modern avant-garde movement. Now, when you talk about surrealism, imagine I, I keep on giving this example. If you look at Sanjay Leela Bhansali's movies like Black, or if you look at Savarya, uh, those movies are actually dealing with the surreal world. Surreal world is actually something which is beyond the real world. It's not the real world. Okay. Now, when you talk about surrealism, surrealism tells you uh, these images which are not related to reality at all. So it is actually something which is opposite to your question that you had asked previously about realism right and uh, surrealism dadaism they're all associated they were associated with artistic movements for example uh, if you look at this image okay if you look at this image uh, priyanka what do you think this is what do you think this is this is an example of a surrealist dadaist uh, surrealist dadaist painting this is this painting that i've shown you is actually a modern surrealist dadaist painting so dadaism surrealism were actually precursors to absurd drama as well this picture is basically can you can you guys tell me what is this picture there's a doubt that priyanka has asked about surrealism what do you guys think how will you describe this image okay how will you how will you describe this image what do you think uh, this image is all about. What do you guys think? What is this image looking like to all of you? If you have to define this image, very good. All of you given the right answer. Modernist poetry is the right answer. Well, how would you define this image if I tell you? This image basically... Yes, Sanki, of course, of course. We will rather be conducting one uh, session only on literary movements itself. There will be one session that will actually be conducted on literary movements. So you don't have to worry at all about that. Uh, so that will of course be there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So Anki, uh, we will be actually doing this this entire. This is a very good suggestion that you give it. We will take a note of this. So one uh, session will actually be there on literary movements. So you don't have to worry. Okay. Kuhu is saying looks like cheese to me. Kuhu, you're making me hungry by, by mentioning cheese. A uh, packet of chips. Okay. This painting is actually a very, very famous painting. This painting painting is showing you this painting is showing you a window and from this window you can only see from this window you can only see the neck of the giraffe this is actually a window this is what surrealism was all about this is a window and this is the neck of a giraffe this is the neck of a giraffe the neck of a giraffe so this is what surrealism was saying surrealism and dadaism was saying we'll capture whatever we think is reality for us it is up to you how you want to interpret it, right? Someone would be like, how on earth you, could could you have imagined that this was actually a window and uh, you know there was a, the image of giraffe? So Priyanka, that is what surrealism and Dadaism is all about. It is moving away from reality. Whereas Priyanka Bachche, your previous question in realism, if they would have asked you this picture of a giraffe, they would have made sure that there were proper curtains. So you could have made that you know this is a window. Uh, they they would have made proper curtains. They would have made a proper uh, giraffe over here that you could identify is a giraffe and then you I would have asked you you would have said that yeah it is a window and from that window you can actually see a giraffe right from that window you can actually see a giraffe Yeah, Lakshmi, we will be coming up with a strategy with you also that how you can make most of these two upcoming months that you are having, how you can make the most of these upcoming two months that you are having and how you can ensure what all topics need to be covered and what all support we will be providing you. Okay, so don't worry about this. And Montreal group of poets, is, these are a group of Canadian modern poets that we are having. Montreal is a place in Canada and this is associated with modernist poetry. So Montreal group of poets, very famous, they were actually a group of poets who got a renaissance in Canadian poetry. They got a renaissance in Canadian poetry. They marked a break from the traditional picaresque landscape poetry. The picaresque landscape poetry that was there, they marked a break from this kind of poetry. That is what they were doing. Okay. And these people were encouraged by, uh, like, you know, by poets like Ezra Pond, by T.S. Eliot right remember Ezra Pond saying that poetry is a kind of a mathematics right uh, W.H. Auden so this is how you have to make connections and do remember things and stuff okay uh, so that is of course there a uh, very simple question your terms of literary criticism are very important particularly for your RPSC exams for your uh, for your UPPCS GIC exam for your gate exams so when you talk about anagnosis when you talk about catharsis when you talk about peripecia these are all important words what is the right answer here 
<laughs> Murnal is like, uh, like surrealism is a kind of dictatorship. Yeah, surrealism is like, you know, I'm depicting, that's art for me. Right? That, that's what modern art is. That artists need to, therefore, explain their work of art. Yes. So what, what do you guys think is the right? Very good. Very good. So whenever you talk about peripitia, peripitia is a reversal of fortune. What do we mean by peripitia? Peripitia is nothing but it is the reversal of fortune that you experience, right? The reversal of fortune is what is called as peripitia. So that is absolutely the correct answer. Anagnosis is recognition. Anagnosis is recognition. Uh, so when you undergo a process of anagnosis, anagnosis is recognition. And then when you talk about catharsis, catharsis is considered to be purgation, a purgation when you are trying to relieve yourself. So here reversal of fortune is peripitia. This is the last question and I'm sure all of you will get the correct answer very, very quickly so that we can proceed to uh, your post-colonial writers very quickly at a very fast pace so all of you so so far i think the suggestions that we've got i'm just jotting it down we've got the strategy for two months video the strategy for two months video and particularly covering all the things how you can crack it make sure that you prepare a study plan and we'll probably prepare a plan for all of you also in that there was also literary movements by anki i think anki had made that request from the classroom platform and I think there was one more request which I'm forgetting. But anyway, well, yeah, on feminism. So, so far there were three requests. We, we will try to definitely convert these kind of sessions in the upcoming marathon classes then. Okay, yes. Right, that is the correct answer. So when you talk about Gulliver's Travels, Gulliver's Travels is a must-read work in the upcoming days for the library. You will get Gulliver's Travels in your Grade Up Studio library as well. Now here, when you talk about the voyage to the Honanum land, the, the land of the horses, remember Jonathan Swift was a misanthrope. Jonathan Swift, Swift was a misanthrope. Misanthrope, miso root word means hatred. Miso root word means hatred. And anthrop means mankind. Hatred towards mankind is misanthropy. Misanthropy, when you hate mankind. Swift said, the more I know men, the more I love my dog. And that is the same thing that can be seen in Gulliver's travels. Gulliver is disenchanted with mankind. He has seen the Lilliputian world. He's seen the Brobdingnagian world. He's seen the world of scientific discovery. And he's given up all hopes. And finally, his hopes are pinned up on the Hononyms, the, the land of the horses. And that is the utopian world. That is the utopian world. And this is the last book that you have when you're talking about the Gulliver's travels. The Adventures of Lemnian Gulliver that we are having uh, by Jonathan Swift. So do remember that the last book is representing the hatred that Swift had, the hatred that Swift had towards mankind. Any comments that, that are there? Yes, Sukiti, uh, the literary chart, I will be giving you literary criticism chart, right, uh, Sukiti? So, Katie, yeah, the literary movement chart. Yeah, I will be, I will be uh, organizing one class on your literary movements itself. So, don't worry. The most important movements we'll cover. That will be very, very simple. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, Mrinal, I always want you people to feel uh, happy. Okay, there was one more question added. Okay, let's very quickly answer this. We'll not discuss a lot. Which of the following is not an Australian writer? So the first answer itself you should have known because Margaret Lawrence is a very, very famous Canadian writer. Margaret Lawrence, the writer of the Stone Angel, she is writing the Voling Dunes Roman. What is the Voling Dunes Roman? She is writing the Stone Angel. Stone Angel is an example of Voling Dunes Roman. And what is a Voling Dunes Roman? A Voling Dunes Roman is a work wherein you are definitely, you are definitely growing up, but you you fail to grow up in your mental level you're definitely growing up you physically grow up so margaret lawrence is showing us that you know certainly the protagonist is hagger uh, is hagger is the protagonist of the stone angel by margaret lawrence she grows up but she is very hell-bent she's not able to undo her prejudices she's still bad with her sons she's, she's still bad with her daughter-in-laws whereas the remaining are your very very famous australian authors that you're having and which of the following is not a revenge tragedy? Your Volpone is the right answer. 
because the remaining are path breaking uh, revenge tragedies you must remember that revenge tragedies were inspired by seneca revenge tragedies were inspired by seneca senecan tragedies are inspiring uh, like you know your entire revenge tragedy tradition that you must keep in mind okay all right so let's very quickly okay there's one last question this answer this question i i would want all of you to answer very very quickly and then we start with post colonialism very quickly please answer this question which novel of daniel defo was considered to be the best by em foster very quickly sunita so, kapil is saying for cultural studies yeah i think that is also an important uh, this thing cultural studies can also be one of the So we'll have a lot, like you know, we'll have two uh, marathon sessions per week. So you can all give your topics, and I'm sure they'll all be covered. So don't worry. Yeah, but cultural studies, I think yes, you should really work on that, and you need help because I don't really think there's a lot of structured material available on that. Uh, yes. Shall we gate exam? Okay. All right. All right. Volpone, yeah, Volpone was the correct answer. Here, what is the right answer? Which novel of Daniel Defoe? Right, which novel on Daniel Defoe? Right, which novel of Daniel Defoe was considered to be the best by E. M. Foster? So E. M. Foster considered E. M. Foster considered yes. Most of you got it right. Mall Flanders to be one of the best because you know he said Mall Flanders is having the best characterization. And remember E. M. Foster why he was commenting on it because he was writing his work aspects of novel. And while he was writing aspects of novel, he was looking at these prototypes of novel writers first in order to write his book. And therefore he thought that you know Mall. Flanders is definitely having uh, some of the best characterization techniques. Some of the best characterization techniques are available in Mall Flanders, right? They're all available in Mall Flanders. Therefore, E. M. Foster has called this book as a masterpiece of characterization. Therefore, E. M. Foster has called this book as a masterpiece of characterization. Okay. All right. Now, please uh, take a like you know take a quick thirty second break. Stretch yourself a little. Uh, stretch your muscles. Get up a little if you want to. Take out another blank sheet of paper. And now we're starting on with post colonial literature. Now, this basic lecture will, I'm sure, give you a very strong holding on what is the post colonial literature all about. What are some prototypes of post colonial writings, and how is post colonial literature emerging? because you know it's very simple for us to say that okay this is post colonial literature but most of the times we are not aware about what is the right answer okay how can we define post colonialism what is post colonialism so those all things are important for all of us yeah yeah kuhu absolutely uh, i will look at all your comments at the studio as well as uh, on the platform in a bit but here i want all of you to focus Now, post-colonial literature, and and just try to understand it like a story, and I'm sure you will never forget. Now, post-colonial literature actually came about in like you know the early 18, 1980s and 1990s. So, when you talk about 80s and 90s, this was a period where post-colonialism had started coming up in a very big way. Uh, you can say it started getting discussed. People started looking at it. Uh, and here, when you talk about post-colonialism, the question became that what is essentially is post colonialism all about how do you define post colonialism what is post colonial literature so you must understand that post colonialism is a literature that is written at the backdrop of colonialism that is written at the backdrop that means it's trying to talk about a scenario where we were all colonized but after colonialism what are the impacts that we are undergoing it is a literature of resistance it is a literature of resistance it's trying to resist the colonial representation the colonial narratives it's trying to resist the entire process of colonialism so if you had watched like you know so th there's a channel which is like you can you can watch any channel for example uh, but there's one which is called beyond world is one uh, this is a news channel that you have uh, beyond or if you you go through al jazeera or like a uh, cnn or bbc you will see that britain is actually undergoing a very tough period right now uh, as we speak uh, britain is actually undergoing the after effects of brexit britain is having the second round of the pandemic which is even more worse because you know the second type the second breed has come and And they will now go for five more months of lockdown. So Britain will go for five more months of lockdown. 
we 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 still don't know about that of course uh, in india it's it's opening up the schools are also opening up but britain will go for five more months okay then the problem is even worse why the problem is even worse because you know uh, they have this crisis with scotland scotland has said that in the may upcoming may elections if they win they will definitely conduct another referendum and they will move out of uh, england completely they'll move out of the Brit the great britain completely so clearly you can see that you know the reporters were saying that britain is now facing the same things that it had actually done to the colonies so you know that that was basically having a post colonial stern that means they were still thinking from the perspective of colonialism that britain has done these bad things to everyone and now they are suffering all right that means you're still thinking in those lights you're still thinking about the process of colonialism you're still thinking about the ills that they have done to you so here when you talk about when we are simply talking about you must remember and you must keep this in mind i will just hide this because you know this is important post colonial literature is dealing with the backdrop of colonialism and it is resisting colonialism it is written at the backdrop of colonialism and it is resisting colonialism this is a very important point this actually goes in your blank sheet of paper so colonial post colonial literature very first thing is actually a resistance it's kind of a, a measure of resistance you're trying to resist the colonial rule you're trying to resist the colonial rule completely so this is a very important point that you have to remember that whenever we are trying to write a protest literature whenever we are engaging in resistance writing that's the first benchmark the empire is writing back the empire is writing back that is post colonialism when the empire wants to write back the empire wants to write back that is the process where you have colonialism that starts we still have many cultural legacies of colonialism we still the way that we think the way that our constitution is partially developed the way that we have the legal system the way that we have a lot of other things those, those are all colonial legacies right or for example when 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 a person like me who is living in delhi uh, like you know born and raised in delhi most of the majority of the time so here we can see that you know cannot place lot cannot lot cannot of course we tried to decolonize by calling it rajiv chowk but most of the times people call it cp only cannot place lord cannot named after lord cannot or uh, for example uh, of course we try to decolonize but still we can clearly see that cultural legacies remain or latians delhi the way that it is built on the british architecture and we can clearly see we we always try to resist these colonial legacies by engaging in a process of decolonization be it the language issue that is what you study in english in india angrezi hatao campaign what is that that is marking a process of decolonization the new education policy by focusing on the regional languages is trying to start the process of decolonization is trying to commence the process of decolonization completely post colonialism is a field that has been rapidly expanding you can see the number of academic journals you know uh, almost 10 years ago or forget about 10 years ago 5 years ago we we would type post colonialism we wouldn't get so many paperback works we would not be able to get access so many books on post colonialism as much as we have today today if you go on amazon and just type post colonial literature or just post colonial you'll have like you know one full page or more than that with suggestions and recommendations and all these books are under 1000 or under 800 or under 500 which most of us like you know can at least try and forego something very uh, crucial this week and and purchase it so you can clearly see it is a fast expanding field of study it is not only a fast expanding field of study it's also like you know a uh, fast becoming a field of study where you have a lot of conferences you have a lot of webinars seminars and and literally the the it's it's actually mind boggling to see the number of uh, these editions that we are having now we need to understand that whenever we talk about post colonialism it is important for us to first decipher first understand first remember what do we mean by colonialism what is the proper definition of colonialism what do we mean by colonialism now please 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 keep that in mind why is there a need for post colonialism because colonialism was a violent oppressive history colonialism ensured that we people were violently suppressed colonialism ensured that we people had to face like you know the native population by we i mean the native population had to face hostility 
that it was a very violent history that we are talking about so colonialism when we talk about colonialism it's not a peaceful but a violent history that we are having and that's the same thing that happens with south africa in the context of apartheid so colonia or colonialism is actually coming from the root word colonia one one this is one meaning this is one meaning colonia and colonia is actually one of them is basically that you're trying to make colonies you're trying to make colonies imagine if i'm sitting over here at my hand yes 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 of course so they're all there tension is saying what is resistance from the point of view of literature tension resistance is you're trying to undo the representation from the literature's perspective tension literature of resistance is when i i completely undo i do not accept your representation i am giving you my representation i don't like your representation of native population i will give you my representation that is called resistance in literature right so tension is asking what do we mean by resistance in literature resistance in literature means i am not happy with your explanation i am giving you my explanation i don't think your explanation is good i'm giving you my explanation okay so here you have to understand that whenever we talk about colonialism colonialism saw it was a violent process it was not you know for example if i'm sitting over here and uh, if i uh yes of course and if i if there is gunjan uh, chetri over here and if i go on uh, like you know if i go to gunjan's house and i say you know this is my house she say i what the hell are you are you mad are you totally out of your brain do you have like you know the the ownership papers do you have the property papers how can you just say that this is my 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 land i'm not i'm not getting away from this land and i'm like no okay fine i violently attack her i hit her and then i i like you know i i probably uh, abduct her and i keep her in my custody and then i i make her sign the papers and then i take her house that is exactly what colonizers were doing so colonialism was not an easy process of course we had weak leadership but we had resistance in india when the colonizers were coming your maratha warriors were there there were many other several parts of the kingdom who were trying to fight and thus we can see that there is a forcible occupation that is there there is a forcible occupation i will just give you the example of zimbabwe the britishers reduced the population of zimbabwe from 1 crore to 3 lakhs just by colonial just by colonial repression coercion measures violence so colonialism is all about violence there are brutalities there are brutalities there are physical violence and along with that along with that they are trying to systematically control along with this what are they doing along with this they are trying to systematically control and what are they trying to systematically control are social economic and cultural our social economic and cultural world they are trying to systematically control our 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 social economic as well as our cultural domains that is what they are doing they are trying to control it right for example if you look at peru right peru uh, right during the early decades of the 16th century the spanish conquistadors they reduced the native population from half a crore to about 3 lakhs and the same thing happened with zimbabwe as well right the same thing happened with zimbabwe. so even forget about zimbabwe in even in india so many people were killed the the number of people who were killed they, they you know always remember that they'll always surpass the historical records because records are trying to undervalue the number so if records say that you know 1 lakh people died estimate that more number of people would have died right it's never that you know 50000 people have died and they'll they'll say 1 lakh until and unless there's some government uh, intention behind that so it is a violent history colonialism is a violent history right when we talk about when we talk about regions like zimbabwe in in zimbabwe they were using they mowed down they completely destroyed they reduced the african uh, opponents just like grass you know just like you, you you're telling grass telling telling of grass is like you know when you're cutting grass the same way they tried to completely take power away from the native population the native people were not having any power whatsoever the native power were not having any prop, uh, any power whatsoever so we can clearly see when we talk about post colonialism there is cultural violence if you understand these themes you will be able to understand your writers properly you will be able to understand the politics of these writers properly so there was cultural violence that had taken place there was cultural violence that had taken place 
and therefore we see that people were trying to resist this kind of cultural violence people were trying to resist this kind of cultural violence by their of course like you know by either engaging in extremist groups and later people like premchand and all they were using the source of literature so clearly always remember whenever we talk about post colonialism we can never be blind about the physical violence aspect and here on your blank sheets of paper this is very important please write this down i will of course repeat it again when you talk about south africa when you talk about south africa after independence also the segregation continues apartheid continues the racial segregation continues apartheid continues so this is something that actually continues now when you are talking about south africa after the end of apartheid what happens the blacks start perpetuating the crimes why because you can never undo the history of violence you can never undo the aspect of revenge that people have in their minds you can never undo that that specific history of violence that is very crucial that is very important and that that's something that you have to understand and remember right so whenever you talk about whenever you talk about okay so here whenever you talk about whenever we are discussing about these kind of statements you must remember that post colonialism is always trying to talk about this history that people want to, uh, want us to be aware about not just how they try to control us culturally but they also perpetuated violence on all of us and another notion of colonialism which is still prevalent in today's time is that you know you have the concept of the mother country for example you know a, a great britain was a mother country and we were going across different territories and we were trying to colonize that is what the colonizers would say so this entire concept of your mother country and the conquered country that is also colonialism you have this entire concept that you know the country from where you're coming is the mother country and the country and the country to where you you are like you know going and capturing is the conquered country is the conquered land that you are having that is the conquered land that you are a part of i'll just hide this for a second so that you can see so another concept that you have of post colonialism sorry of colonialism is this entire term is this entire term of mother country and the entire term of conquered country right and the entire term of conquered country so here you need to remember that you know this entire relationship so this this actually started what used to happen is that when you talk about roman empire right uh, roman settlements the roman settlements the Rom roman colonia settlements away from the heart of italy uh, which was the center of the roman empire they were nevertheless inhabited by people who still retained their rights as roman citizens that means see what what was happening is that the roman empire if this was a roman empire they were going to egypt that is where uh, like you know julius caesar as well as antony they met cleopatra or they were going to other parts right of the world uh, or alexander came like you know uh, and traveled to different parts of the world and he tried to conquer so this entire notion that you know the country from where i'm coming is my mother country and the places that i'm trying to control those are the conquered lands those are the conquered lands can you see the sense of commodity that you are acquiring a commodity you're already thinking that means you're trying to dehumanize the natives you don't have any humanity towards the natives you're trying to dehumanize the natives completely now this is the definition of colonialism that we can get from the roman model where you have the mother country right where you have the mother country which is called the metropolis the mother country is the metropolis the mother country is the metropolis because you know that is the more advanced country so to say and that is how you know people who are advanced will actually engage in in occupying the lands of others so you are advanced technologically but you are still not advanced on in the humanitarian front that is the duty of the post -colon -col colonial writer to get in front of the people that you might have had technological might but you did not have humanity at all that you were willing to take away someone else's land right so you can clearly see that the conquered country the conquered country which is actually transformed into a colony and all the resources are taken away from this conquered country all the resources are siphoned off all the resources are siphoned off all the resources are taken away from this conquered country i will just remove this bar for a minute so that you can actually see it um right so all the resources are siphoned off all the resources are taken away from this entire country that you are going towards for exploitation
So you can clearly see that there are two meanings of colonialism. One is the meaning of violence and the other meaning that you have of colonialism is the meaning wherein you have your mother country and you have the conquered country. The mother country and the conquered country. So this is the second meaning of colonialism and both are very, very important. This is a map of the British Empire during the 1920s. When you see the 1920s, you can actually see like literally the parts that they have occupied. These, these highlighted parts are the parts that they've occupied. Now, why this map has been inserted over here? Because remember, these will actually become countries which will be called as your Commonwealth countries. And later, these people will say, no, we do not want the title of the Commonwealth countries. We are post-colonial in nature. We do not want this title at all. We do not want this. We do not want this tag at all that we are the post-colonial uh, nations or sorry, we, we're the Commonwealth nations. Now, if you see these highlighted areas, we can clearly see that Britain, this tiny island that we are having, right? This tiny little island that we have is literally occupying, is literally occupying. Can you just see what all places it's trying to occupy? So this is the mother country. This is the mother country. This is where the mother country is there. And these are all your conquered areas. These are all your conquered areas. These are all your conquered lands that you're having. So this teeny little, little uh, island country is able to colonize literally the entire world, is able to have their sway over everyone. So you can see that Britain is acting as a colonial mother country and then you have, you have so many other regions which are actually the conquered lands. And these together will have, these together will produce the, the literature of resistance. These together will have the literature of the resistance because they have a common colonial legacy. They have a common colonial legacy where they were all colonized by the British Empire. Where they were all colonized by the British Empire per se. Now what is the focus of post-colonial studies? The focus of post-colonial studies is to look at this capitalistic oriented uh, expansion process. How people, for the sake of acquiring more wealth, for the sake of expanding their economic contours, for the sake of getting more economic resources into their nation, were engaging in the art of colonialism, were engaging in the habit of colonialism. Because post-colonialism is looking at the 16th century trend. Post-colonialism is looking at the 16th century trend wherein because of profit, because of profit, because of capitalism, we could easily see, because of profit, because of capitalism, we could easily see how, how these, uh, like, you know, these so-called powerful nations were trying to have their motherland and they were trying to occupy conquered countries. They were trying to have conquered countries. There is a relationship between colonialism and capitalism. There is a clear-cut relationship that we are able to see between colonialism and capitalism. You are able to see the fact that, you know, that, that this entire new trend of acquiring more wealth, of improving your economic position, that is becoming very important. That is the most crucial aspect that we are having. So post-colonialism is telling you about the situations that had actually occurred or existed, right? The situations which occurred or existed after the end of the colonial rule, after the end of colonial rule. What happened after the end of the colonial rule? This is what these kind of literatures are looking at, right? This is what they are all looking at, that that how was the state of affairs? What were the impact that we had to undergo after the colonizers left us? What and 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 we can only understand the impact if we know that what had they done to us? If we know that you know whatever they had done to us and they have not even given a correct picture of what they had done to us, they are so ashamed of even acknowledging the fact that you know that they had ruled over us and they had perpetuated crime. Not even a single book properly deals with that. That is a problem of post-colonialism. Now, whenever you talk about post-colonial literature, please always remember post-colonial literature is actually a literature that is taking commonwealth literature within its, uh, like, you know, its arms and it's taking colonial discourse analysis within its arms.
post colonial literature is a way a methodology that you know why why do we see that suddenly commonwealth literature is not no more there we had the commonwealth writers prize which used to come in your net exams up until 10 years ago but now you don't have a single question on commonwealth writers why because of course salman rushdie proclaimed that commonwealth literature does not exist and amitav ghosh rejected in 2001 amitav ghosh rejected his commonwealth prize he said no i don't want the commonwealth prize i'm sorry because in the book that you're giving me the commonwealth prize for i'm actually writing against you i'm actually writing against the colonial empire and how can i take the gift how can i give like you know take the gift of the award from someone whom i'm, I'm trying to resist completely so do keep that aspect in mind that whenever we talk about post colonial writers whenever we talk about post colonial literature post colonial literature is taking commonwealth literature and colonial discourse analysis by colonial discourse analysis i mean the the teachings of michel foucault the teachings of edward said and together forming this new france panon and forming this new uh, like you know this new branch of literary studies called the post colonial literature so we can clearly see that post colonialism became a part and it brought together it brought together two existing fields it brought together two existing fields with it and what are the existing fields the existing fields are commonwealth literature and colonial discourse analysis the themes are commonwealth literature and colonial discourse analysis so we can clearly see that commonwealth literature is not disappearing any way or it's not that commonwealth literature is no more alive but now commonwealth literature has got a new name just like you know you got the cars for example like you know there was a car by by tata which was like you know the tata harrier and now what what the tatas have done the tatas have done they face lifted tata harrier and now the tata harrier will come as a tata safari so it's a face lifted version so you can't really say oh where is the tata harrier gone it's a car that that used to be there uh, a wonderfully beautiful looking car uh, especially very good when it uh, you you have that in black color or i, I think it was a four wheel anyway so you know it's coming in a re re revised version it's coming in a repackaged version so the same thing is there with post colonial writers your commonwealth writers are now being retermed as post colonial writers the commonwealth literature actually becomes your post colonial literature so most of your commonwealth writers are relevant when you you put them under the bracket of post colonial writers as well like achebe like vs naipaul and we'll just see all of those writers as well so do keep that in mind that you know these two separate aspects are coming together and they are forming what is called as the post colonial literature so instead of calling us ourselves as commonwealth writers now we are giving them a new term that is post colonial right that is post colonial now whenever you talk about the word commonwealth the commonwealth that means you are trying to still take your identity from the britishers right the britishers are giving you your identity the natives that were the natives that were occupied uh, were colonized by the britishers they are coming under yes ab zishan is right that you know it's also called new literatures it's also called new literatures that are emerging in india so for example your in igno even before this it would not call it commonwealth literature the igno booklets course would always be about new english in um, new english in india or new indian english writers or like you know the new literatures that were emerging and many other universities had the, had similar names rather than calling it commonwealth so here we can clearly see that the name was actually borrowing from the british identity the names were so all all the nations that shared a common history a common history of british colonialism they came to form the confederation with the british monarch as its head the british monarch was the head of this particular state so clearly we can see that commonwealth literature was something that was very hard for people to digest people were not very happy people were not very excited and thus we can clearly see that you know commonwealth literature became very very problematic now what had happened was that there was a first major attempt to define the term commonwealth writers there was the first major attempt that was made by people to define the term commonwealth literature when right when at the university of leeds in england they organized the first commonwealth literature conference and they were trying to bring uh, like you know the entire body of english literature that was coming from the british empire the erstwhile the prior british empire right the writers of vs naip writers like vs naipaul chinua achebe they were all being grouped under the commonwealth literature domain 
So the University of Leeds in 1964, what it was trying to do, it was trying to put all the writers. It was trying to put all these writers who were actually writers uh, who were occupied by the British territory under one category. All right, under one category. So those are the things. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, Sukriti, we're just coming on to the writers as well. But do understand this trajectory because I'll tell you, these are the questions that are coming these days in your exams. When was the first Commonwealth literature debate taken place? University of Leeds is the correct answer in England. This is a question that was asked. Okay, this was a question that was asked. So you must keep that in mind. Okay, so you must remember that that is also important. So this question was actually asked. What was the discussion? What did they discuss at the first conference? And this conference, what it was trying to do, it was not trying to incorporate writers from America, even though America was also colonized prior to 1776, even America was a British colony. But people were not getting the literature from America because America had become economically super powerful. So no one had the audacity to get the literature of America into this category. Okay, so one such writer, one such writer that you have, who is actually a, a kind of a semi-post-colonial and a Commonwealth writer, and very important from your net point of view, not so much from net point of view, but from your gate and other exams point of view, is of course your uh, Vidyadar Suraj Prashad Naipaul, V.S. Naipaul. He passed away two years ago, and he was a person who was Indian origin writer, recipient of the Nobel Prize in 2001, but he never ever liked to be called as an Indian. Or or an Indian origin writer and that is the reason he said India an area of darkness he had written the work India an area of darkness one of his works that was there so people like V.S. Naipaul people like Bharti Mukherjee they don't like their Indian uh, originness at all they, they rather shun their Indian originness as much as possible which was very surprising and I, I really applaud that because when Kamala Harris the videos that you see of Kamala Harris when she became uh, she took up oath and she said that I'm an Indian origin Indian origin she was very clear about the fact because her mother was Indian so that is something which was very different that she was proud of her Indian heritage uh, and clearly here this Trinidadian writer uh, who is of course having British origin was never ever proud of his Indian ancestries all right so that was of course there uh, he is of course uh, like you know very very pessimistic about developing nations he he considers so if, if you can so you know one of the problems that people have is if you talk about Khalid Husseini okay if you talk about Khalid Husseini so if you're talking about Khalid Husseini many people have a problem with Khalid Husseini that Khalid Husseini by giving you a representation of Afghanistan is actually pandering to the western representation of Muslim states that Muslim states are repressive towards their women. Muslim states do not give equal opportunity to women. So Khalid Husseini is not giving you the true picture of Afghanistan. The same problem, you know, people have with V.S. Naipaul, that V.S. Naipaul is still having the lens, the glasses of the colonizers. And he is thinking that, you know, there are problems with the developing nations and he's not able to look at the problems that were there with the developed nations and their entire exploitative practice. You have a bend in the river, which is a very famous work of Naipaul, and a bend in the river is, it's actually, you know, this question comes directly. A bend in the river is a reminiscent, like, you know, it's reminiscent of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. This is a direct question that you get on V.S. Naipaul's work, right? A bend in the river is actually based almost on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. It is telling you, it is telling you about this journey which is there at the heart of Africa. And it is looking at notions of personal exile, how you're going away from your own uh, nation. And it's also talking about individual corruption. It is telling you, you know, this work, why Bend in the River was very important to talk. Like, you know, people always, whenever they're discussing V.S. Naipaul, they'll always quote a Bend in the River because they will tell you that V.S. Naipaul, just like, you know, that is the reason I had given you the, these questions. They were looking simple, but thematically, they're all correlated. Hugh D. Brass is criticizing. Remember, in this lecture only at the beginning, we studied Hugh D. Brass by Samuel Butler. Butler is criticizing the fact that, you know, you, you have have destroyed your monarchy but you did not have a better option than monarchy you should have looked at the options first you people were incapable of ruling yourselves and you destroyed the monarchy also 
and the same thing here naipaul is doing naipaul is saying you people are incapable of ruling your own selves you people have political corruption you see money even though you know you might say we need to change the world but the minute you get power and the minute you will have money in your pockets that very minute you will forget about the goodness you'll be like that is how things are even if i be good there'll be no uh, upliftment whatsoever so that is what naipaul is telling you naipaul is uh, through a bend in the river telling you that the natives are incapable of ruling themselves yet they are still stuck with petty concerns they're still not uh, like you know morally upright that is the position that here naipaul is taking it is telling you about naipaul's skepticism naipaul was highly skeptic that newly decolonized nations will not be able to control themselves they will not be able to take care of their own selves they will never be able to make sure that you know they are able to build a, a proper sound nation the narrator salim is a muslim indian merchant and he opens up this store in like you know a small town at the bend in the river a bend in the river that's the where the name is actually coming from and the towns like you know the towns uh, inhabitants are belgian priest is there a witch is there her son ferdinand is there there's a white intellectual called raymond this question had actually come in one of your entrants who's the white intellectual raymond is the white intellectual his wife yuvet is there the president of the new country he's a demagogue who's a demagogue a demagogue is a person who wants to sway the audiences a demagogue is so you know here he is trying to tell you that these leaders are incapable of ruling people like you and me right now and therefore we require the support still of the colonizer that was the idea that he was trying to convey that we still need the support of the colonizer we are incapable of ruling our own selves right this big man this demagogue hires raymond as a speech writer big man spouts endless cliches about liberalism democracy right and we can clearly see that he is trying to just become this fierce leader who does not have any opponent uh, at all salim is losing control of his store to the commercially inexperienced citizen theo time who hires salim to manage it so there is a reversal of power there is a reversal of power only because someone is like a native he is getting the right to own gradually the town's veneer of civilization cracks and chaos and corruption is there there is chaos as well as there is corruption so you are able to see you are clearly clearly able to see and what is this aspect that you are able to see you are able to see the fact that when you are talking about uh, a bend in the river a bend in the river is a work that is telling you about how natives are incapable of ruling themselves this shows you the prejudices and the biases that naipaul had towards the native people and how he thought that you know the developing nations are unprepared for independence so here he is trying to resonate bernard shaw even george bernard shaw so when you talk about the apple cart bernard shaw even though he is writing important problem plays but he's still like you know a conservativist he's still talking about aristocracy as the best form of governance so some of these very important writers that we are having always remember that they are having a conservative appeal these writers are having a conservative appeal so bend in the gangs is a very important work this is a must read work you will be getting it in your studios as well a house for mr biswas this is the novel about failure this is a tale about failure that you are having and this tale of failure is a tale wherein we are able to see wherein we are able to see that post colonialism this is the only important theme that naipaul actually gives us that when you are talking about post colonial writings there is no happy happy endings because in reality there aren't any happy endings post colonialism is a struggle and post colonial world is telling you about failures post colonialism uh, is telling you post colonial world is telling you about a world wherein uh, success is not possible at least not for the first generation but if the first generation is able to continue then of course it will be easier for the second generation it will definitely be easier for the second generation so a house for mr biswas is here uh, like you know a proper novel by v s naipaul published in 1961 which is uh, telling you about which is telling you about mr biswas and his entire endeavor to create a house for his own self because he wants to like you know let that house be a representation of he wants the house to be a representation of what he's calling it like you know an assertion that he has arrived 
an assertion that he has arrived in this world that is what he wants the house to be an uh, a symbol of the novel is telling you about of course and, and the novel begins only with the death of mohan biswas so the writer knows at the very beginning the fate of his main character uh sorry the reader knows at the very beginning the fate of his the fate of his uh, main character so we know at the very beginning that a central character mohan biswas about whom we are reading who had got these astrological signs that you know he's born with an extra finger so things will actually go wrong with him soon we know about his death at the very beginning and he's dying because of a heart disease at the age of 46 how he is going in trinidad as as a part of indentured laborers indentured laborers were contractual laborers that were available and here you know this entire story of how he wants to have this own house uh, how he he is not wanting to like you know be subdued by the tulsis he doesn't just wants to be a person who's living uh, because of their in-laws but he is not able to create a proper house at all for himself and indirectly there were autobiographical elements because naipaul's own father had undergone a very similar issue hello right so that is something that you all have to keep in mind right so that is an aspect that you all have to keep in mind whenever you're talking about a house for mr biswas right a house for mr biswas is thus sorry yeah so here we can clearly see that the house of mr biswas is telling you about a story of failure a story of failure that is taking place because mr biswas is not able to form a proper house in a free state is also very important because this is winning the book of prize it is telling you about his various experiences that he had across uh, across various countries that he was trying to visit so naipaul has been very autobiographical in his writings very very famous lines by naipaul the only lies for which we are truly punished are those that we tell to ourselves and this is a reality if we are dishonest to our own selves if we are dishonest to our own selves about our strengths about our weaknesses about our development areas that is the biggest lie that we are telling those are some of the biggest lies that we are telling this is the line that i want you all to focus on because this is a very important theme in post colonialism post colonialism or the asian writers are tales of failures these are tales of failures all the things that were read to me by my father were the stories about things becoming all right at the end of each story that we are told we are always told that there there will be, there will be a happy ending and unfortunately that is never a reality good evening umesh unfortunately that is never a reality we never really have happy endings we never really have those really happy uh, peaceful endings at all right so do keep that in mind that here whenever we talk about post colonial writings post colonial writers are writers who are talking about the stories of failures post colonial writers are writers who are telling us about successes that are never ours or never achieved right they never ever achieved the world is always in a movement and this is a reality so even if we start late even this is a answer to all the questions that you know you were asking that there are just two months three months the world is always in movement even if there are three months even if there is three days i think you know if you give it your best shot then you're obviously going towards your own success right you are moving towards your own success that's of course there chinua achebe again the father of modern african writers he is considered to be one of the pioneering african writers and he is a father to modern african literature he is a nigerian novelist very very particularly uh, famous for his depiction of uh, like you know the misrepresentation that the africans had undergone in the writings of the foreigners or in the writings of the western world he is trying to show you that right yes absolutely morium the house is a symbol of his identity of course uh, we are not looking at the work in detail we are just looking at some sample prototypes which are very very important for us and here his particular concern was the emergent africa and the moments of crisis he you know achebe achebe says these lines and and they, they will be included in this particular presentation here achebe says that you know you people think that our names are different but our names are not different these are, this is our life we had a history before you came you people were ignorant about the history it's not our fault it's not that we never had a history we had a history as much as you had a history it's not our duty or uh, like you know to ensure that you people should you should have done the research right you should have done the research of course a very very important novel things fall apart the title taken from william butler yates is the second coming 
This is the first most important novel or the first novel of Chinua Atribe, which was written and published in 1958. And Things Fall Apart was very important for the creation of the Nigerian literary renaissance. It is responsible for, and you get this direct question, it is responsible for the Nigerian literary renaissance. The novel is telling you about the life of Okonko. How Okonko is representing the old African values and how there is, a, uh, there is this divide between traditional values and modernity that is taking place. How there is a divide between tradition and modernity that takes place and things fall apart. Okonko is the leader of the Igbo community. Okonko is the leader of the Igbo community. And we come to know that how he is hell-bent and he is sticking to his own values. There were of course some problems that Atribe talks about in the traditional atmosphere. But he is telling you the impact of the westernized education. He is telling you how people are suffering um, under the British colonial rule. He is telling you that there was a history which was prevalent. Of course not written but orators were definitely there in African history before this. Right. So you can clearly see. You can clearly see. Okay, Madhuri, we're discussing all these examples only right now. Okay, I will come on to your doubts. These, these are the examples that we're discussing. And Sano and Said, we've already discussed it uh, in elaborate detail in one of the lectures. And remember, I told you post-colonialism is actually coming from two terms, right? Uh, is actually getting two important frameworks. One is Commonwealth literature and the other is colonial discourse analysis. The colonial discourse analysis we've done multiple times, where we've spoken about Foucault, where we've spoken about Fano, where we spoken about Edward Said. So these are the three people who are a part of your colonial discourse analysis. These are people who are a part of your colonial discourse analysis. Okay. And here, of course, you come to know that, you know, there is this representation of women, which is a very important concern in the tribal Igbo community, uh, how women are having no powers per se. That is, of course, treated. So this is a novel which becomes symbolic of, you know, that there's this very famous quotation that Godemar also talks about, that you're able to meet people who are actually there on Nigerian streets in this novel. You can actually see them. Right. Uh, here, of course, and, 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 you know, things fall apart. All the questions are very important for things fall apart. Noe, how is he getting westernized education? How many parts are there? What happens ultimately to Okonko? Uh, what are the various, uh, like, you know, what are the various uh, characters, and norm, the normal characters, not so important characters? So things fall apart is a very important novel. It's a must read novel that you have. You will be finding this novel also on the studio uh, in, in terms of detailed analysis. Then you have a sequel also, No Longer at Ease. This is an HP Setka favorite question. No Longer at Ease is a sequel that is written to Chinua Atrabe's Things Fall Apart. Here he is telling you that, you know, a newly appointed civil servant who has actually come from England with a westernized education. He is very well versed about the problems that are there, but he is still not able to keep his morality intact. Why he is not able to keep his morality intact? Because when you are tempted, when you are having temptations and you have obligations, you will be prone towards corruption. That is the reason Marxism very, very famously says, and all the people would also agree, power corrupts, right? And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts you absolutely. Absolute power corrupts you absolutely. Corrupts you absolutely. That means if you have power, then you will be having corruption because you know to control that power. And this is a very important point that we also see in the works of Gabriela Garcia Marquez, whom we'll just read uh, as another prototype of post colonial writings. So do remember that whenever you talk, these are very common themes, themes of failure, themes that, you know, the minute, even though I might be very, very educated, but the minute I come to power, I will, I will, uh, like, you know, be prone towards corruption. I've not seen the entire series, but, you know, a little bit that I saw with my brother, even when you see in Tandav, right, uh, where you have Saif Ali Khan, etc. So Saif Ali Khan is killing his own father. Why? It's not that he's shown as absolute criminal at the very beginning. He's shown because he has this want of power. And Dimple Kapadia, the so-called wife of the, like, you know, the, 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 the politician, the father, Saif Ali Khan's father, who's being played in that movie. Dimple Kapadia, of course, is like, you know, she's not going up front and revealing that her, uh, her son has done that, is asking on the funeral scene that I know what you've done. Now you make me the prime minister. So again, power. People are wanting power. 
all that people are looking at and that is the post colonial syndrome that even though you might have that means there's still not a very strong moral resolve or there's still not a moral center that has been created so far that is the problem in post colonialism the arrow of god is there right here we can clearly see about christianity about so you know another important theme in post colonial writings will be the impact of christian education the impact of christianity the impact of tradition versus modernity these are also important aspects that you're able to see in these writings now please remember whenever we talk about i'll i'll very very quickly give me 5 uh, to 10 minutes very very quickly give you some of the very important lists of post colonial writers but please keep that in mind whenever we talk about post colonial writings there was actually there was actually a hidden there was a hidden agenda and this is a question that is asked also behind naming commonwealth literature or giving commonwealth literature to the name commonwealth literature salman rushdi who attended like you know who attended this conference at the university of leeds he said that you know he highlighted two problems what were the two problems he said first of all commonwealth literature does not include english writings like it's not including british writers why that means you want to differentiate that it is not british writings it is a writings that is emerging from the colonies and it is not at par with the british writers it is not something that can actually give competition to the british writers you are trying to separate it you know you are trying to separate like you know just like you have seeds you have seeds so when when you talk about like you know for example if this is a match that you've gone uh, so the, the front uh, benchers at the ipl are the people who can afford like you know very expensive seats the people who are actually sitting over here are the ones who, who are not very capable of affording such high highly expensive seats at all so that is what salman rushdie is talking about salman rushdie says that in the commonwealth literature why have you not included english writers from britain itself why have you done this segregation because of the fact that you wanted to identify a new category that was emerging because of your legacy that you left but it was not at par but it was not at par with the british writers at all it was an inferior kind of literature not at par with commonwealth writings so this was a problem that salman rushdie had and therefore he was able to identify this hidden agenda that this hidden agenda was to differentiate you know this is what even edward said says post colonialism is always saying that you are creating this divide you are trying to create essentialism remember post colonialism is against essentialism you create these categories you create these buckets you are creating these buckets and it's very difficult to move beyond these buckets and here you are able to see that whenever you talk about writers like rashti right writers like rashti were focusing on these hidden politics of the word commonwealth they said that you know that people and 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 they said okay fine i might and and this is a reality they said first of all the problem was that what about people who were like you know uh, maybe indians but they were not writing in english like mahashweta devi mahashweta devi is considered to be a very famous writer even though she was writing in bengali because of post colonialism commonwealth literature would have never identified her or for example uh, tagore has now got a lot of fame in south america and they're translating his works so what what about like you know you can't really straight jacket you can't really put people in one category that these are indian writers these are uh, these are like you know zimbabwean writers these are your sri lankan writers you can't do that that is what rashti and people like rashti were talking about people were saying they were telling you that you cannot at all say that this person is coming from this nationality and therefore his work is like you know an indian work his work is a bengali work people like rashti were saying you cannot like you know put literature into compartments tagore's work proved to be influential in south america it was translated this is a very important question that can actually come in your exams tagore's work was actually very influential in south america his poetry was translated by the argentinian author called victoria ocampo victoria ocampo translated tagore and this is a question that can actually come in your exams who translated tagore's poetry victoria ocampo so post colonialism would say that commonwealth literature was not looking at these kind of translations it was only saying this is indian writings but see tagore is relevant in south america also Tagore has found a voice in South America also people have identified with Tagore in South America also 
and when you talk about magical realism for example magical realism was followed by gabriela garcia marquez but it also influenced people like rushdi so salman rushdi was also equally influenced so you can't really say that you know gabriela garcia marquez is only a latin american writer you can't really say that and that is the reason you are having a broader work that is word that is post colonial writings rather than just trying to talk about natives so clearly commonwealth literature <coughs> was not able to factor in the various kind of plural voices that was a major concern that was a major issue and ultimately we saw that there was a decline of commonwealth literature and there was a coming in of post colonial writings there was a decline of commonwealth literature and there was an arrival of post colonial writings right there was an account of post colonial writings now and you know commonwealth literature was not liked by people people were not liking this classification right people were not liking this classification that you know they they said that you know this is an unattractive term this is an absolutely unattractive term people like amita ghosh they refused uh, amita ghosh refused his commonwealth prize for the glass palace he refused his prize he was getting the commonwealth prize in 2001 and he refused the prize he said i do not like this he wrote a letter also he wrote a letter also and he said that you know my work i cannot i cannot i do not even want to because in this work i am i am not at all glorifying the empire rather i'm talking against about the colonial past commonwealth literature wanted to glorify for example if we were commonwealth writers we were thinking oh what about those good old days they were very good they were very nice but that is not what like you know writers like amitav ghosh wanted to do writers like amitav ghosh wanted to uh, present the works in a new light altogether right okay i'm glad nargis that this is your favorite novel okay so do keep that in mind so we can clearly see that commonwealth literature became a troublesome term it became a problematic term a why why was it problematic they can actually give you this question that which of the following were the reasons that commonwealth literature declined the reason was that a it became a problematic term because of the fact that it was not right it was not including not including english literature from britain why why was it not including english literature from britain and why was it not including literature from america that that means you were trying to create a, a second world uh, literature you are trying to create a third world literature you you think that those students are not like you know top students that is what you are trying see for example if i say that you know this test is not for the topper the first two people who are there but this test is for everyone else then i am creating a distinction so people had this problem that why britain britain why are they not including their own literature and why are they not including american writers even america was also a british colony then the another problem that emerged was that it was absolutely narrow minded in its approach and this was a term that was being used to talk about glorification of the empire it wasn't being used for talking about the problems that were there right it wasn't talking about the the like you know the lack of uh, or, or not just lack i think the the exploitation that had taken place during the colonial period so thus the term was losing its favor and we saw that this was the emergence of the post colonial writers this was the emergence of post colonial writers and these all writers who were identified as commonwealth writers earlier were also easily coming under the banner of post colonial writings could also easily come under the ban banner of post colonial writings commonwealth literature was not taking into account literature from other languages like you know mahashweta devi's works Mahashweta Devi's works, like not that post-colonialism. Post-colonialism also focuses on Indian writings only, or some of the works that are getting translated into English. But look at the Bengali author Mahashweta Devi. Mahashweta Devi has been acknowledged as a post-colonial writer because of the translation that we had of her work. So one of the major difference between Commonwealth and post-colonial is this is trying to glorify the empire. This is trying to provide resistance towards the empire. right there is an anti colonial resistance there is an anti colonial resistance there is an anti colonial resistance that we find in post colonial writings whereas commonwealth literature had a sense of nostalgia had a sense of nostalgia that was available 
right so you are able to see that you know whatever the effects this is actually starting from where we like you know uh, coming to where we started from you are trying to undo you are trying to subvert the colonial violence you want to undo you want to subvert the colonial violence that has undertaken please a lot of post colonial literature is talking about scramble for africa the scramble for africa people were like you know so how africa was divided you know people had taken a map of africa and literally they cut the paper okay this this territory uh, portugal can take this territory italy can take this territory german can take this is great britain they literally cut it on a piece of paper a nation reduced to a paper and a map to be taken by people who were powerful so clearly we are able to see that you know whenever we talk about people like atrebe uh, who is called as the father of modern african writings or whenever we talk about gabriela garcia marquez these are all people these are all people who are important post colonial writers okay this is a very very famous quote of atrebe which uh, i'll just quote uh, before telling you a list of other important post colonial writers when suffering knocks at your door and you say there is no seat for him he tells you do not worry because he has brought his stool this is the post colonial way of writing like you know uh, a normal writer normal british writer could not actually easily explain this it's it's so simply explained by atrebe and this is how a post colonial writer writes it's a very colloquial style of writing when i tell the problems that you know that uh, i'm not using any fancy terms at all here atrebe is not using fancy terms here when i'm telling the problem please go away because i've been told by people like benjamin franklin that problems when they are coming mighty and big just don't tell them uh, how big they are just tell them that you are you're big enough to confront them and when you're telling them the problem is saying okay don't worry i've come with a stool implying that the problem is there to stay For example, if your problem is that oh my God, the net exam is in two months. Now how how can I prepare? Then you must understand that you know this problem has actually come with a stool. It will stay with you. You will have to find a solution to the problem. You can't escape it. So the common, the post-colonial way of writing is a very very colloquial way of writing. The post-colonial way of writing, even if it's not colloquial, is a very simple, lucid form of writing. But it is a writing that is resisting. Right? It is a writing that is resisting. and here this is very important the author's purpose by atrebe and this becomes the purpose of many post colonial writers let me first make one general point that is fundamental and essential to the appreciation of african issues by americans africans are people in the same way indians are people in the same way that americans europeans asians and other people are we are not strange we are not people with unpronounceable names we are people uh, you know who are having a proper history that you need to understand right these are aspects that you must understand and keep in mind these are things that you have to focus on and you must keep that in mind right so these are of course important aspects and uh, some of the themes which are very very common in atrebe's work he is talking about culture and colonialism he is talking about masculinity and femininity and these are some of his very very important works that you are having okay similarly when you talk about you can actually uh, go over these similarly another most important post colonial writer now very very quickly in 5 to 10 minutes i will tell you i'll not take a lot of time some very important post colonial writers for today jean reese is also an important post colonial writer jean reese was a person who did not get a lot of uh, like you know she she was not at all popular but because of the white sagasso see she got an instant fame she got instantaneously she became famous and jean reese is trying to give you she is trying to give you a reworking of a canonical text by charlotte bronte jane eyre she's telling you the story of bertha mason and according to her bertha mason she's giving her a name also antoniet according to her you know she's literally bertha mason herself She was a woman of european ancestry she was born in dominico caribbean she's coming from the caribbean right and and she is she is like you know she is a white creole she is a white creole that we are having we can clearly see that she was sent to england where she finally settled to write she was not at all famous but when she published the white sagasso see which is a post dated prequel it is a post dated post dated prequel to jane eyre post dated prequel to jane eyre which is telling us the story of bertha mason she is a person who is exemplifying the post colonial discourse 
she isn't afraid to like you know she's looking into the empire via her narrative she's looking at the canonical work and she's not afraid she's not at all afraid to talk about the fact that you know your narrative is incorrect Bertha Mason, who's the um, the central character of the White Cigar Society, is a Creole herself, like Jean Rees, right? Like Jean Rees itself. And here we can clearly see that the that, like you know Charlotte Bronte has silenced Charlotte Bronte has silenced uh, Bertha Mason, but here Jean Rees is giving voice to Bertha Mason, the Creole. She is giving voice to Bertha Mason, the Creole, and that is a task of a post-colonial writer. Jean Rees's work is a direct response to the depiction of people, right? People are depicted as crazy, loony characters. You know, Charlotte Bronte is depicting her as a loony, loony tunes show, crazy woman. She's saying, "No, Creoles are not stupid. You have driven us mad. We are not mad. You people have driven us mad because of this violence that you perpetuated on us." Rochester, therefore, is an example of colonizer, and Bertha Mason or Antonio is the colonized. Right. She has also written tales of the White Caribbean. Tales of the White Caribbean help us to understand the Caribbean culture from where Jean Rees is coming. The tales of the White Caribbean. The White Caribbean. Again, look at the term that she is using. Right. So the way that she is using those are, uh, of course, very important for all of us to remember. Okay. And here we are coming on to another major post-colonial writer that is Gabriel Garcia Marquez, right? That is Gabriela Garcia Marquez. And Gabriela Garcia Marquez is a person who is bringing magical realism as a new way of writing for the post-colonial writers. This is a new way of writing that is being used by Gabriela Garcia Marquez. So Gabriela Garcia Marquez had, had famously said this famous quotation, I don't believe in God, but I'm afraid of him. I'm afraid of him. He is a Colombian novelist. He's a Colombian novelist who's considered as one of the greatest South American writers. One of the greatest South American writers. Very, very famous for 100 Years of Solitude as well as Chronicles of a Death Foretold. He's also very famous for this book, which is in many syllabuses, Chronicles of a Death Foretold. Chronicles of a Death Foretold. This is also a work that is being written by Gabriela Garcia Marquez. Right. And here, when we talk about this Colombian novelist, he is, of course, the recipient of the Nobel Prize. And he's very, very famous for a Roman of Fluve. Roman of Fluve is a novel that is having many generations. Roman of Fluve. Roman of Fluve is a novel that flows. It has many generations. First generation, second generation, third generation. So that is like, you know, uh, that is an example that we have. So whenever you are, we are talking about 100 Years of Solitude, 100 Years of Solitude is telling you the story of Aurelana Bondile. So here we, we, we are able to see that, you know, this narrative that we have, this story that we are having, uh, it is actually a story that is telling us about this politician who is becoming so uh, crazy about, like, you know, keeping his power that he's distrusting his family members. And how people like these who are power hungry create a banana republic because they're only worried about their own power. They're only and only worried. So, you know, the story is telling you the story of a fictional Colombian town. It is a story of a fictional Colombian town called Macondo. Very important question. It is telling you about the rise and fall of the Bondia family, the Bondia family, the Bondia family and how power actually corrupts you completely. That you become afraid how, you know, the more power you will have, the more mistrust you will have. You will not be able to trust people easily. So that is, of course, there. And here we are able to see that, you know, the mighty Jose Arcadia Bonde. He is, of course, a uh, charismatic founder of the Makonda, Makonda to a madman of his fringes. Like, you know, this is basically telling you about this entire family. It's a Roman of Louvre. It's telling you about a generation. It is literally telling you about 100 years of solitude. That people who are using, people who are ruling, they aren't having a very pleasurable life as we consider. Bringing you the reality of Colombia, bringing you the notion of banana republic. So post-colonialism will capture that, you know, our situation in our own countries have, have really deteriorated. Because of the fact that, yes, yes, of course, Gunjan, uh, because of the fact that, you know, that people are still replicating the colonizers way of exploitation. Unfortunately, the colonial legacy has not been the legacy of architecture. The colonial legacy has been a legacy of exploitation. The colonizers have taught us exploitation. 
the colonizers have ensured that we are only and only focusing on exploitation he is using magical realism that is a very important form that he is using he found a completely new way of expressing the new realities of the post colonial world so magical realism is within the matrix of realism you're trying to comment you're trying to comment in like you know you're using uh, magical aspects but you are within the matrix of realism you're commenting on a major issue okay you are commenting on the major realistic issues that you are having it is telling you the story of several generations living in macondo in colombia as a fictional town macondo remember you get many questions in your exams which are related to the settings you have to match the following with the settings right so that is of course there and here you also have another work the autumn of the patriarch the autumn of the patriarch is also telling you about the corrupting influence of power it is literally telling you that you know whenever and 100 years of solitude is also telling you it's solitude because of power you're only worried about power might money increasing wealth increasing don't think that the richest people are the happiest people because they're worried about how to maintain their richness how to that is the reason the bill melinda gates foundation bill gates is like you know a little superhero because he's a little different in that way Derek Walcott a very important nobel prize recipient coming from the caribbean writing the omeros omeros based on homer's epics right so derek walcott a poet coming from the caribbean called saint lucia coming from saint lucia very important caribbean writer he is one of the first important post colonial poets that we are having was becoming very very popular Walcott is trying to write his poetry he wants to rewrite the colonial history Derek Walcott wants to rewrite the colonial history of the people and he wants to write rewrite the history from the victims perspective he wants to give an alternate history he wants to give an alternate history he wants to write the history from the perspective of the native population right he wants to write history from the perspective of the indigenous people the indigenous people omeros one of his famous works is actually taking from the epic of homer omeros is taking from the epic of homer right omeros is the poem after which he got the nobel prize right it's an epic poem that is trying to immortalize caribbean island of saint lucia it is trying to immortalize by using the epic framework can you see the style of writing the style of writing of these writers is equally important he is using the epic framework to give voice and identity to the voiceless marginalized subaltern people of saint lucia the dream on the monkey mile uh, uh, the monkey mount a mountain very very famous work again right Yes of course of course uh, yes nirmit you're absolutely right okay the dream on the monkey mountain dream on the monkey mountain is a play that is telling you about a man who has a dream and this dream is like you know this is literally an allegory of caribbean history culture and colonialism it is trying to literally show you the the connections between caribbean african and europe identity european identity peter carey is also a very important post colonial writer he is the recipient of the booker prize and he is getting the booker prize for this work called the true history of kelly gang he is also getting the booker for oscar and lucinda but this work has post colonial themes this is telling you and you know here you have to make a comparison here you have to make a comparison uh, with gugiwa thiongo's work gugiwa thiongo is also writing the trial of deden kemathi the trial of deden kemathi the trial of deden kemathi this is a work that is written deden kemathi that is written by gugiwa thiongo and mongro so this is also telling you that deden kemathi was considered to be an extremist according to the britishers perspective but he was a hero for us that is post colonialism change of representation change, differences in narrative deden kamathi for the britishers is someone who is an antagonist who is a, like you know an extremist but for us deden kamathi is a real hero right yes of course four will also be added nargis i will be giving you four's example also okay <clears throat> and the same thing is happening in the true history of kelly gang kelly gang is represented as a gang of extremists but for the natives they are like robin hood they are people who are killed uh, by the by the colonizers uh, on an unjust ground they are killed telling you about the group of ned kelly telling us about the group of ned kelly 
Arundhati Roy is god of small thing. You got Talkia, a Pakistani serial of Sanam Sai, the beautifully made serial also. Again, telling you about this notion of colonialism in a way or the post-colonial disrupted identity from a diasporic perspective. Right. So remember, post-colonialism is just not always giving a counter narrative to the colonizers. It's also giving a counter narrative to people who have started behaving like the colonizers, who started oppressing people around. Right. Uh, here, uh, when you talk about school days by Patrick Cham, uh, Patrick Chamosio's uh, school days is giving you the impact of the colonial education that how you start thinking, you know. So th there's this perspective. Many people have debated that when you talk about Malala. So Malala, uh, when whenever she gives any speech, you can actually see that Western gaze in her speech. That we Asians do not give our daughters an equal opportunity. We Asians are barbaric. We Asians, the same problem that we actually had with, uh, with like, you know, uh, the, how can I forget, Jeho, the movie Jeho, right? Or sorry, Slumdog Millionaire. We had this problem that, you know, why are they showing our... Um, why are they showing our slums? We can do that, that reality that we have, right? Because that's a Western gaze. That's a Western gaze because it's much more than the, the like, you know, the slums only. There's much more to India than the slums. So don't just give us the Western gaze that we are only slums. So the same thing happens over here also. That is, of course, there. Kotsi is a very, very important, prominent writer. Uh, in this PDF, you can see I have added some more post-colonial writers. But please remember, some very common post-colonial themes are you want to undo, you want to subvert the colonial narrative. You want to undo, you want to subvert the colonial narrative. You want to foreground the violent history. You want to foreground. Please remember. Remember these themes. You want to foreground the violent history, the violent history of colonialism that they have not talked about because they have said it's white man's burden. They have forgotten about the violent history completely. You want to ensure that you are trying to provide your resistance via literature and you are trying to give voice to the subaltern. You are trying to give voice to the powerless less voice to the subaltern you are trying to give voice to the subaltern today along with this pdf i will yes of course literally i will be sharing the pdf you can take a look at them uh, along with the pdf what i'll be doing today i will be sharing uh, another uh, like you know book with all of you which is having some important terms related to post uh, colonialism you can even look at those terms like alterity uh, other words that are associated with colonialism and you can take that book as a reference book uh, which will help you understand the terminologies of post colonialism as well okay so do remember how colonialism is developing as a concept do remember what are the major ideas of colonialism how colonialism is taking commonwealth writings as well as the post-colonial literary discourse post-colonial literary discourse is about Foucault Foucault's notion of knowledge production is about Edward Said is also dealing with the notions uh, of like you know a France Fano they're all coming together and we've discussed about these writers in greater detail already Okay, feel free if you have any doubts. I've taken based on your suggestions today. I've taken down a list of some of them strategies for two months, literary movements, feminism, cultural studies, gate. And still, if you have any doubts, please come on to the Grade Up, Grade Up Studio platform. And in the doubt section, you can, uh, you can issue a request, uh, for the title of your marathon session. Okay. All right. On that note, we will end today's class. I will see you guys tomorrow. And should you have any issues, do let me know. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for joining me in. In, uh, the three days for the marathon sessions tomorrow we'll have a normal class but it's a very important class on Canadian writers okay so then please take very good care of yourselves I will sh uh, I will share the PDF on the group and I will see you guys tomorrow take care bye god bless bye Nargis bye bye Rabia thank you Madhu okay now your comments are coming thank you thank you Anki thank you Madhu bye take care bye Sikirti